Hi, Saru, you're live. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to session one on ecology. Um, I'm Saru Salia from Northwest University in Pochestrum. Um, we uh, in, invite you to the uh, uh, first four um, presentations of this session. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, put the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, the chat box is for any comments, or, um, but not for questions. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to um, introduce our first presenter is Prof. Marion Mayer, and he will tell us more about fairy circles. Over to you, Marion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for everyone for joining. I appreciate that. Um, do you see my uh, presentation? Can I continue? Uh, I think you are, you would should see my presentation now. So I'm going to start and stop me if you don't see it. Um, during uh, the last number of years that we've been working in the Namibian desert on the fairy circles, we noticed often that some of the big succulent euphorbia species are dying in, in big numbers. Uh, Gumifera gregaria, as well as Gumif uh, damarana. We then decided to, to determine uh, if we can quantify this, the state of health of these euphorbia, uh, if our observations are correct or not. So just a quick background, the ferry circles are located on the coastline area, mostly of Namibia. We found them uh, a year or two ago in this area and even up into the Kalahari Desert. Um, their distribution matched the uh, distribution of Euphorbia gregaria very well in this area, Gumifera very well in that area, and then in the north, that of Damarana. In short, the main theories on the uh, formation of fairy circles are gas, termites, self-organization, and then last year we provided some evidence that euphorbia caused them. Um, we saw in many places uh, dead euphorbias that's been there for decades, according to previous reports, and all of them you will still not see them being covered in grass. Um, uh, we've obtained an aerial photograph of the Harup region in southern Namibia. This is a small part of the aerial photograph. It was taken in 1966. We ground through all these black spots and found them to be Euphorbia gumifera. There are no other big species growing in that environment. We didn't uh, determine what happened to these uh, Euphorbia gumiferas in 2015, ground truth them all, of course, found that 134 of them have died and formed fairy circles or what looks like the beginning of fairy circles. Another 69, that is now of the 406, were also dead, not yet forming uh, fairy circles, they were busy decaying. So shockingly to us, uh, that is a uh, half of the species that were on the aerial photograph have, have, are dead. Uh, we looked uh, for seedlings or young plants, found virtually none. The same applies to Euphorbia gregaria near the Fish River Canyon. If you have sandy deposits, you find many dead Euphorbia gregarias. So if you would uh, do historical imaging uh, comparison, uh, we have also seen that several of them are busy dying or either already dead uh, a 10 year period roughly. So our hypothesis is that succulent euphorbias are declining in high numbers on sandy soil because possibly of climate change and the low water capacity of sand. I flew with a micro right over the, the Brandberg area and it was clear to see that they are performing very well. They look very healthy on hills and on mountains. When you get to sandy areas, they have basically disappeared, or you will see them in some places, but they will survive on inselbergs or 
copy soil hills. If you would zoom into uh, many of the sandy deposits of from southern to northern Namibia, you will often see this site of a few remaining Euphorbia damaranas in the north and then Gumifera or Gregarias in the south. Uh, Louis Scott from the University of Free State did some very interesting work on fossilized hyrax middens. He did this work in the Sand Sea area. I'll show you a map just now. But he found that the uh, Euphorbia pollen, if you look and see the, the red parts of this, these bars, were a substantial percentage of the pollen of the big species or tree species in the area where he worked then it seemed to get much less and uh, stayed uh, just a, a few uh, percentage points uh, of the big species. So Louis Scott collected the, the, the Hyrax middens in this area, Namib Sansi. In the Namib Sansi, between the, the dunes, you will often see thousands of large fairy circles. Now the question is then, where are the euphorbias? In this region, there are no euphorbias left over. If you look, uh, you will find them about 100 kilometers away from this area. So how do we explain that? I'm not sure yet, but uh, it could be coincidence or not. But it, during the time that they, uh, the pollen uh, decreased substantially, 1,300 years before present approximately, that was one of the driest periods uh, that Namibia has experienced in the last 2,500 years. Uh, these records were from the Spitzkopper, just north of, of, of Brandberg, or south of Brandberg, very close by. Um, if you look at temperature records, then at about 1,200, 300 years ago, it was very warm. So it is a possibility that they died out on sandy areas, and that is the key word, because the stress is so much more if you have drier, warmer conditions on sand. So the aim of our study then is to, to compare the state of health and quantify that of Euphorba damarana plants by comparing satellite images of 2012 and 2021, and then determining the NDVI values. The NDVI uh, values is a very good measurement of photosynthetic activity or the presence of chlorophyll, in other words, alive plants. Uh, I just want to mention as well that we focus, I focus on this uh, Euphorba damarana and this talk because of our previous work on the fairy circles, but we saw many other species that didn't look good on sandy deposits. So what is the NDVI uh, values that you can determine? If you take a healthy plant, it will absorb a lot of red light for its photosynthetic activity and reflect a lot of near infrared because of the chlorophyll. It will reflect less red light back because it's used in photosynthesis. If you have a stressed plant, the red light reflection will be more, relatively more, because there are no or very little photosynthetic activity. If you then look for uh, at a near infrared light, uh, less will be reflected back because of chlorophyll breakdown. A plant with an NDVI value of roughly a 0.33 uh, would be stressed or diseased. Uh, we uh, identified two sandy uh, analysis sites and two inselbergs or hills surrounded by sand in the Brandberg area on satellite images then identified 40 Euphorba damarana plants per site uh, on satellite images. So we had to go there and ground truth that, that what we saw on uh, satellite images were actually Euphorba damarana. So we confirmed that and we could proceed. So the healthy and dead Euphorba damarana plants were digitized as polygons, a little circle or whatever was drawn around them. And we did that with QGIS. We then uh, use these polygon shape files with the uh, with the euphorbia being marked, lifted that from the raster or that map or that image, and we could determine the NDVI values of the euphorbias themselves by using a raster calculation algorithm. 
The results were then extracted from QGIS and analyzed in Excel with the t-test. This is what the area looks like. Very sandy. There is Brandberg, Uchab River running through there. Thousands and thousands of fairy circles. Here's some Ephorba Damaranas remaining in some areas there. This is where Brandberg is situated. The sites were 500 by 500 meters each. Here you see a false color image of a small part of one of the analysis sites. Uh, here in Damarana 1.2, you will see a healthy Damarana plant. The false color gives you the near infrared reflection or focuses on that. That is your band one uh, if you do this type of analysis. If it's not a, a, a bright pinkish color or, or black, blackish like that one, then it's dead. Uh, here we can even see remains of a few uh, Ephorba Damaranas. These were ground truth, so we were there. And then you will see some in-betweens. That is sort of brownish, pinkish, and that would be like 50-60% dead. So our results then were that we saw many dead Ephorbas on the sandy deposits, even like this big one is dead, that one is partially dead. And on the hills and the mountains, they looked lovely and healthy. We, in each side, then looked for seedlings or small plants. And it was shocking to find in these 500 by 500 meter sites, four plants smaller than uh, two meters inside one, and uh, one only inside two. Here you have a video, short 30 minutes, uh, 30 <laughs> seconds video to show just uh, some part of this, uh, of the amount of dead. This is the remains of a uh, dead euphorbia. There's the other remains, these dead ones. This was now taken in November this year. That's a healthy one, or partially healthy. Here is a 100% healthy one. And here you can see a number of dead ones also. Okay, we can move on. How did we do the NDVI determination? Here is just an example. In this uh, interesting C-shaped growth form or growth pattern of these euphorbias, there are some alive, like the top one. Uh, in the middle, we also see another one that's alive. And then here we see a number of dead ones. If you would look at the false color of this, you will see the bright, or yellow, uh, pinkish purplish colors indicating living plants or partially living plants and then dead ones and dead ones because these were marked in this example we marked six they were marked and we could extract them from that raster and do the 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 um sorry at the move and do the ndvi calculation so the bright red ones for the ndvi are very healthy and the ones with a lot of uh, white in them uh, shows there this uh, it's partially dead or 80% dead in that particular case. So our results then uh, showed that in all places that we analyzed the Inselbergs, the uh, solid green bars being 2012, striped ones 2021, we could see a significant difference in the NDVI value, for in, they, therefore much less photosynthesis, less chlorophyll. In each of the sites, we had the same significant P smaller than 0.05 uh, difference. What I need to say as well, we saw many, and we noted that, and we will also report that one day if we uh, publish that, there were many dead just remains of uh, Ephorba damaranas. We're doing a, a chemical analysis, metabolomics of these also to be sure that it's damaranas. And they were, of course, not taken into the NDVI determinations because there's nothing left there. Um, just then, uh, what happened in the past in that region? So we drew constructed the polygon that you see in white here around this area, uh, covering our analysis sites. And the rainfall you will see then since 2012 of that area, 
it's wonderful data one can get on a uh, climate surf the website of server global data being supplied by nasa and you can see how small or how little the the precipitation was since 2012. You can also determine the NDVI values from this website. Uh, we then, in this polygon, it would have taken account of the plants in the Uchap, the Damaranas around here, and uh, basically no grass during this time, but in previous times there were. So we were shocked to see that the NDVI values were this high before 2012. We then analyzed end of 2012 around here and compared it to the current, uh, this is then uh, September also of uh, last year. So if we would have had uh, satellite pictures of, of images of previous times, the, the difference would have been much higher. And what we learned from this is that you cannot just pick two years and make a, 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 a good um, um, uh, be sure of what you see on NDVI values. So you have to look at a long-term trend. Marion, you have one minute. That. You have one minute left, Marion. Thank you very much. Two slides left. So like the lonely survivors in the sand. So this is then just a typical uh, uh, photograph from a micro light to show here and there in between the fairy circles which is most probably the tombstones of previous growth of Iforba Damarana, and we have in the south the same with Kumifira and Gregoria. Conclusions then, uh, the, these three succulent species are declining in areas of sandy soil, and it is possible, very difficult to determine if climate change is the main driver. Uh, it is then proposed that hundreds of thousands, millions, some uh, scientists say, of fairy circles are the tombstones of the earlier presence of succulent euphorbias and therefore a startling indication of climate change. We will expand this study to many more sites and locations in future. Thank you very much to Digital Globe for providing a number of uh, satellite images for free and to many other peoples that, uh, that help us in the process. That's it, Saro. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Marion. It was very, very interesting. Um, yeah, I don't think those fairy circles will have uh, uh, the same meaning to every to, to everybody uh, seeing them in the future. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I did not receive any Q and A's. Uh, are there any questions? Um, if you want to ask a question, you are just welcome to um, switch your microphone and your camera on. Marion, I've got a question, and uh, I'm, I'm not a um, not a physiologist at all. But uh, isn't this a very time-consuming process? Um, aren't there any any other quicker, uh, more field-based studies that that one can uh, can have the same results? Um, Sorrel, the advantage of this is that you, you, of course, you have to go into the field. Okay. to ground truth that what you see with if what about it's easy they have a, a, a typical intense uh, green bluish color that are basically round so uh, we know them from work uh, for 10 years so when you identify them on your images satellite images course, yeah. uh, then it becomes very quickly so you just uh, digitize them and mm. you do a calculation and uh, if you have learned that i've done that now during the lockdown while I was in isolation, I was forced to be not in on holiday, but yeah, and I learned how to do those things actually, and it, okay. it is faster. But you have to be sure that right. what you see is what there is. It's, definitely, yeah, yeah, that's that's important. We, uh, we've got a question. Yeah, it's very hot. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I've got we've got a question from Sandy Lynn Stienaisen. She says, "Thank you, Marion. What are the population number like?" For those species, are they classed as endangered? No, uh, they will not be classed as endangered. So 
what I have to stress again is that they look very good and very healthy on clay soil, on hillsides and in the mountains. But on the sand, they, you see them in nearly all places where they are on Kuppis and Inselbergs, you will see them on sand as well. But in some areas, they, they, they're just gone. And we think that is what happened there in the desert sand sea. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Berger also have a question. He said, uh, is there any data of the lifespan of these euphorbias under good conditions? Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, that's a very good question. So no, uh, we did some data, uh, radiocarbon dating. We got indications, and but the numbers vary between our uh, different uh, samples we gave to the guys from VIT. But they were like 200 years. So we, we took remains of a few dead branches and things and uh, those were dated like two or three hundred years old. So I think it's quite long, but I recently spoke to the scientists from Oxford and I'm very excited. We're going there next April or this April. And we have an interesting way of, of going to, to go and try and determine the age of fairy circles, but then also the age of the euphorbiates, which we believe caused them. Thank you, Marion. I think we've uh, just um, came to the end of uh, our Q and A session. Thank you very much again for a very very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Soro. I appreciate it. Our next uh, presenter is Emma Ferrara, and she will tell us more about um, pollination rewards in three Nemesia species from the Macquarie. Over to you, Emma. Okay. Good day all, uh, I'm Emma Ferreira and today I will be presenting my research on the possible effect of the community composition on pollination rewards of three Nemesia species in the Makwaland. So Nemesia is a member of the Scrofulariaceae family, which is often referred to as the Leo Beckys or Cape Snapdragon. There is roughly 77 species that are endemic to southern and eastern Africa, where they are mostly concentrated in the winter rainfall regions. Nemesia have nectar spurs, which is thought to be a key innovation. A key innovation is a novel trait which is either behavioral or morphological in manner and linked to the adaptability and speciation of taxa. Nectar spurs is thought to be a dry is thought to be driving diversification in other taxa. However, it is believed that the climate change of southwestern Africa coincides with the radiation of um, diversification of Nemesia. So the knowledge gaps that we hope to fill revolves around the primary driver of diversification. Was the primary driver pollination specialization or ecological specialization? What is the significance of this research? This research falls under a greater collaborative project concerning the evolutionary diversification of Nemesia. It will contribute to our knowledge on the ecology of Nemesia and to the understanding of the role of nectar spurs in the evolution of Nemesia. The aim of this research was to assess the role of nectar spurs and ecological parameters that may have influenced the diversification of three morphologically similar species, Nemesia nisocarpa, Macroceros, and Palcella. So the objectives were to compare the three species in terms of their vegetation classification, their nectar spur inner surface, as well as their pollinator rewards. The study region was in the northern and western capes around Nivotville and Nevaris, respectively. The image on the right shows the study site around Nivotville. The study species were selected due to their morphological similarity, tendency to occur close together but not intermingling, and their spur differences and similarities. Nemesia nisocarpa and Pulchella share similar um, lengths and downwards projecting orientation. Nemesia macroceros has the longest spur length of the three, but also has an orientation of projecting forwards but deflects forwards. The Bromblanquet phytosociological technique was based off of the guidelines stated by Brown et al. 2013 with considerations given by the studies. The data was captured in a unpublished macros enabled Excel spreadsheet called VegCap and then imported into JUICE where a modified twin span classification was performed. 
The presence of nectar was observed on living individuals. In the nectar test, we measured the volume and sugar concentration of nectar by opening the mouth and inserting the microcapillary tubes into the nectar spur as indicated in the GIF. Measurements were taken from 10 flowers of each species. For the inner nectar spur surface observation, the samples collected in 3% glutaraldehyde were fixed in to fix any potential lipids. The nectar spur was dissected into dorsal and ventral, as well as into base, middle, and tip. The standard SEM preparation of samples was followed, with the samples being sputter coated in iridium. The images were captured using the dual SEM at the Center for Microscopy at the University of the Free State. Rusin's 1999 book on plant microtechnique and microscopy was used as a guide for the microtechniques and sample preparation and staining procedures. The saffron and O and orange G staining technique was based off of Sharman's 1943 procedure. The past staining protocol followed was that of the past staining kit by Sigma Orange, as well as Rusin's past protocol, where the aldehyde blocking step was incorporated. The three Nemesia species are associated with three different vegetation communities. Nemesia nisocarpa is associated with community one, Nemesia palchella with community two, and uh, Nemesia macroceros with community three. So Nemesia nisocarpa is found in the succulent shrub community, Lampranthus watermary, Stuberia frutescens, and the vegetation is mostly succulent dwarf shrubs, shrubs, and herbs. The plants grow closely together in patches with bare soil in between. The herbs were often found growing beneath, within, or near the succulent or dwarf shrubs. Exposed bare soil is a prominent feature within the vegetation, and this community was found on a sandy northeast facing gradual to steep foot slope of a hillside. One of the community's naming species, Tuberia frutescens, is a biogeographically important species of the Namaqualand Clipclopper shrubland vegetation unit of the Namaqualand endemics. This community can be loosely compared to the succulent dwarf sparse shrubland community of the Khukhab Nature Reserve. The Nemesia Pochella Hesperantha cuculata Ixia rapunculoides subcommunity is dominated by herbs and geophytes. The shrub layer is dominated by Muraltia spinosa, and the vegetation is the most prominent feature within the subcommunity. This subcommunity is found on loamy sand of the plain that had a flat slope. This subcommunity resembles the nevodeville mosaic observed in Fundamava et al.'s 2008 study, as well as fragments of the nevodeville rockefeld dolerite rhinostefeld and the nevodeville shale rhinostefeld vegetation units. The mosaic described by Fundamava et al. consisted of three vegetation units, all of which are resembled within the Nemesia Pulchella subcommunities. The Nemesia Pulchella Hesperantha cuculata Nemesia Leipolti subcommunity is dominated by herbs. This subcommunity showcases the most graminoid species amongst the subcommunities and communities surveyed within the study. The shrub layer is dominated by Aerocephalus punctulatus, and it is found on the sandy loam of a north to east facing flat to gradual foot slope of a hillside. There is no outcrop present within this subcommunity, and bare soil was very low. Nemesia leopoldi was also found to be fairly common within this subcommunity. The Nemesia palchella hesperantha cuculata aerospermum capensa. The subcommunity is dominated by herbs and geophytes. The Diosporus austro-africana and Viborgia monoptera dominate the shrub layer. The subcommunity is found on a sandy southeast facing plain, and it is perfectly represents the Nemesia palchella population at the Papkelsfontein guest farm. Nemesia gracilis was found to be a rare community member. The subcommunities of Community 2 can be distinguished through the absence and presence of certain groups of species, and most noticeably by that of the dominant shrub species. Nemesia macroceros is associated with the Restio land Vildenoa incurvata Osteosperma monstrosum community. Herbs and geophytes dominate the community, 
and plants in this community grow within patches of shallow soil between large outcrops. This shrub layer was well represented by the restioid species Vildanoa incovata and shrub species Muraltia spinosa. The community is found on a sandy south to southeast facing plain and the soil was shallow as outcrops were prominent within this community, the sizes ranging from gravel to boulders. This community perfectly represents the Nemesia macroceras population found at the Papkeusfontein guest farm and it contains the biogeographically important and endemic taxa of the Bockefeld sandstone fainbos. However, it is also possible that the vegetation is part of the Nefotville mosaic. Although Nemesia palchella and Macroceras occur on the same farm, they occur in different vegetation communities and do not share pollinators, as indicated by their sperm morphology. Here are the results of the nectar test. Nectar was observed in two out of the ten flowers of Nemesia palchella, yielding a volume average of 0.042 microliters and an inconclusive sugar concentration. Nemesia macroceras <coughs> had a nectar volume average All right, Emma, take your time. No problem. You could hear no, that. No problem. The Nemesa macroceras had a nectar volume average of 0 0.309 um, and the average sugar concentration of 0.13 bricks. The result of the inner surface observation showed the presence of trichomes on the ventral basal surface of these species. It is important as trichomes are useful to a pollinator by increasing grip. This indicates that the ventral base surface of the nectospur is expected to come into contact with pollinators. The ventral surface of Nemesia anisocarpa has a dense trichomes that become less dense and shorter down the length of the spur. And the inner spur surfaces of Nemesia palchella are variable, but distinguishable down the length of the spur. The variations in trichome shape and density are seen on both the ventral and dorsal surfaces. And this is the ventral variation. This is the dorsal variation. And interestingly, the dorsal surface shows the presence of trichomes instead of the ventral surface. This is the ventral and dorsal inner spur surface of the base section of Nemesia macroceras, where the ventral surface uh, has sparsely placed linear trichomes. Due to the nectar spur length um, of Nemesia macroceras, there is a greater variation within the middle section. Here is the ventral and dorsal surfaces, where the ventral surface has trichomes and the dorsal doesn't. Lower down the nectar spur, the cuticular striations become smoother and the point of deflection could be distinguished by the contraction of undulating epidermal cells. And um, due to the uh, Next is length, there is greater variation. Okay, wait, lower down the next, the cuticular striations become smoother, the point of deflection is seen. And here we are at the tip surfaces and we can see the ventral and um, on the ventral surface, we can see the glandular trichomes. So this is the dorsal surface trichome arrangement, uh, which has a unique U shape, which distinguishes it from the ventral surface. Here you can see the remnant of where the nectar used to accumulate. So the saffron and O stains lignin, cutin, suberin, chitin, chromosomes, and nucleoli red, whilst orange G stains the cytoplasm yellow to orange. And 
Here in the base of Nemesia palchella, we can see the vascular tissue and trichomes are stained red to orange with both indicate high concentration of nucleoli. In the middle section, the base of the trichomes can be seen as they stained red in between the epidermal cells. The trichomes in the base of Nemesia macroceros um, did not stain as brilliantly red as those seen in Anisocarpa and palchella. The Glandular trichome seen in the tip section stained a brilliant red to orange and um, it can co be compared to the clave trichomes of Nemesia nisocarpa and palchella. The pass reaction showed that the trichomes of Nemesia nisocarpa are hollow with an outer and inner tube. The base and middle section showed the presence of starch within the trichomes. And the trichomes and papilla layer observed in the middle section have an outer and inner layer to the trichome and the inside consists, uh, contains a secretion that consists of uh, polysaccharides. Here I've included the tip section of Nemesia macroceros and the, they showed both empty and full glandular trichomes with the secretions image on the far right proving to be rich in polysaccharides. As PASS reacts to polysaccharides and turns them purple. In addition, the secretion seen in the right image is clearly nectar. As the um, osmium tetraoxide fixation did not stain any of the molecules black. Okay, so in conclusion, the three species don't have the same plant-plant interactions and don't grow together. Nemesia nisocarpa is associated with the succulent dwarf shrub community. Nemesia palchella with the vegetation mosaic described by van der Merwe et al. And uh, Macroceros with Arrestia shrubland. The vegetation associated with the Nemesia species is indicative of environmental or edaphic preferences and provides a baseline for further ecological studies within the genus. The presence of trichomes in the basal, ventral, inner nectospur surface indicates the pollinator interactions with the nectospur, and one out of the three species uh, conclusively produces nectar as a pollinator reward. And uh, Nemesia palchella has the potential to produce nectar, but perhaps not secreted, and the nectospur morphology is indicative of uh, nectar production. These are my acknowledgements, my references. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Very, very interesting. It's great to uh, see uh, also the use of vegetation classification. Um, there's uh, one question. It's, uh, there's not a name add to it. Um, thank you so much, Emma. Great talk. You mentioned that the morphological differences between species could infer that they do not share pollinators. Did you notice different pollinators in the field? Uh, indeed, we did. Well, for the one species, at least for Nemesia palchella, we observed a, a bee collecting pollen off of the um, out of the, out of the becky, and we did not observe that uh, pollinator for Macroceros. But due to the spur length and the Darwin theory, we can assume that there should be a, a different pollinator. I hope that answers your question. I do think so. Are there any other questions? You can just post them on the Q&A box. Or if you want to uh, ask a question directly, you're welcome to uh, just switch on your mic and your cam. Okay, seems to me that there are no more questions. Thank you so much, Emma, for a very interesting talk. I hope you are well. I hope you are okay. <laughs> maybe maybe the drinking well, too much water. <laughs> but, uh, I was diagnosed with COVID, so it's a good thing we oh are doing no. this virtually. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, well, okay. good luck with okay. you for you then. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. All right, that uh, brings us to the um, third presentation in uh, this session. It is by Konrad Geldnes, and he will tell us more about uh, 
a new conservation area of the Hoogop Nature Reserve. Over to you, Conrad. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, so I'm going to talk about a new conservation area adjacent to Kuhab Nature Reserve just outside Springbok in the Saklin Karoo and specifically focus on a, the monitoring that we've done, been doing there over the last 11 years and what we found. And it coincided with a period of severe drought. So I will give brief background of the project and the liter literature around monitoring and then also discuss the study area, the methodology that we used, and then the brief results and summary. So the aim is to establish a baseline from which to assess this change from a previous livestock agricultural land use to the present conservation land use and also to inform Kuhab Nature Reserve's rangeland and wildlife management decision making, which is in line with the management plan and the conservation objectives of the reserve. But there's this byproduct also or additional benefit that we can monitor long-term changes in species composition and vegetation structure over time by doing this surveys, these surveys annually. Um, there are various um, studies looking at long-term changes in vegetation in the Sakhalin Karoo, and there are different approaches. Uh, for example, Nenzelele and co-authors, they looked at decadal changes at 10-year uh, interval surveys, looking at changes between um, commercial and um, communal uh, properties on the, on the fence line. And then there's Hoffman et al.'s approach where they use NDVI changes in the long term as well as repeat photography, historical photograph records to look at changes. And then there's the other type of surveys like Van Rooyen et al. and um, Ute Schmiedel's group uh, where they do annual surveys in the field every year and look at changes that occur on uh, locally. And for interest, the Van Rooyen study is a study that's been going on for more, now more than 40 years on Kuhab Nature Reserve. So the study area is located in the succulent Karoo. Um, it's indicated here in the purplish colors, uh, the different vegetation units that you find there. And on in yellow is the Nama Karoo, the Bushman land. So it's di um, directly um, located on this ecotone area. Um, so the reserve was established in 1966 and gradually expanded. And then since 2009, a number of additional properties were, were added to the reserve, um, indicated here in green, bought by the WWF. And then there's also a, a biodiversity offset property in green. And as you go further east, um, there's livestock properties and an additional um, uh, conservation area for interest was also established recently at the Karasberger Nature Reserve around these inselbergs over here. If you look at the climate of the area, specifically focusing on the annual rainfall, now this is the Kuhab Nature Reserve data record for rainfall on the reserve. And you can see that since 1973, for in this case, there's very distinct rainfall cycles of wetter periods and drier periods and something in between. But you'll notice that from 2015, right at the end, for seven years consecutively, there was below average rainfall, below the long-term average of around 150 millimeters. So this, I think one can safely say, was a period of a severe drought. If we look at the rainfall seasonality, on the left, you have Kuhab Nature Reserve's data. So you'll see there's a clear indication that this is winter rainfall dominated from May to August is the main rainfall season. Um, and if you go further east, this is the rainfall data for Arip livestock farm. Um, you'll see that the rainfall is more spread out through the, throughout the year, the stronger contribution from summer rainfall. And the quantum also becomes less as you go further east. But for the purpose of this study and this presentation, we will focus on this specific property right across south, uh, where the yellow star is. And that is very much a winter rainfall dominated area. So for the methodology, uh, annual surveys, field surveys are
week of August or first week of September. You can line transect 500 meters per site. And we use the descending, descending point method of RU. So you have 500 points, data points per site. And at each inter meter interval along this line transect, you record the first plant that you strike with a descending rod, as well as the second plant that you strike, uh, since some plants are and others, and they may hide under the canopies. Um, we calculated range condition using the grazing index method and also looked at the change in Shannon Wiener's uh, index of diversity. And we also looked at how growth form abundance changed. Here we focus on the frutescent gametophytes, for example, the Carubosis like Iriocephalus, the semi woody ones like uh, the subfrutescent gametophytes. And then there's also the leaf succulent gametophytes, which is your mesem shrubs mostly, uh, like Ruscia robusta. And then also the hemicryptophytes, the perennial grasses, and then the pterophytes or the annuals. So over the years, a large number of permanent vegetation monitoring transits has been established over this whole conservation area, over the greater Kuga conservation area. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the first ones were started in 1974 on the reserve itself. Um, since 2011, we started to put out uh, transects on this extended conservation area as they were added. And for this pres presentation, as I indicated, we will look at four transects on the Rattlecrawl South property. And we will look at two transects in the Yule's habitats, in the Yule valleys and then also two transects on the sandy plains towards the right. So this is what it looks like. There are two habitats on the left, two monitoring sites, which is in the mountain valleys. Um, it's generally sandy vegetation, but there's a larger component of gravel and rock present than you will find in the sandy plains, which is exclusively consists of sand. If we look at the rainfall on Rattlecrawl South specifically over this period from 2011, um, indicated by the green arrow, you will see that initially at the start, there was fairly good rainfall, variable, but not too bad. But from around 2015, there was a sustained period of below average rainfall, both in terms of annual rainfall indicated in red and uh, winter rainfall also as indicated in blue. So if we look at what happened to rangeland condition change over this period, as calculated with the felt condition score, you'll see that there was a significant decline in the rangeland condition in all the habitats up to present. Um, if you look at the, the slope of the plains habitats, which is in green and blue, you'll see that the, the slope is much or slightly sharper, indicating a faster decline than the hills habitats, but, but all of them declined nonetheless. And for interest, if you look at the felt condition score, you'll see that uh, some of the habitats are approaching zero, indicating that there is very little live perennial matter left. Um, at the start of the monitoring period, um, gain numbers or pressure from gain grazing could have played an additional factor. Um, so if you look at the gain numbers for the entire Kuhab Nature Reserve, so this is not just for Radlkral because we can't separate them, it's an open system. You'll see that uh, from 2011 to 2014, if you look at the, the black line, the Gemsbok numbers were initially elevated. But as the felt condition deteriorated and the drought started to set in, Drastic um, measures were taken to reduce the populations of the game, especially the Gems book. Um, so you'll see that the, the trend indicates that there's been a sharp decline in the Gems book numbers from around 2014-15, as well as that of Springbok, indicated by the green line, and also the ostriches, ostrich and pink, but that was not actively culling, that was just natural die-off. It's only the, uh, the Hartmann's Mountain Zebra numbers indicated by the red line that will remain constant. So what happened to plant cover if we look at the trend? Uh, if we first look at the black lines, that indicates uh, what happened to total vegetation cover in all of the habitats. Um, there was a decline, 
but it was only significant in one of the habitats, one of the mountain valley habitats in terms of habitat B. But if we look at perennial vegetation cover, then in all habitats, there was a significant decline over the monitoring period. And now if we look at the perennial life form cover, which I showed earlier, if we focus first on the left and look at the mountain valleys, what happened there? So in black, is indicated the frutescent camaphytes or the carubosis. You can see that they declined significantly, as did in red the leaf succulent camaphytes, which are the, um, the mesome shrubs. And in green is indicated the semi woody camaphytes or semi woody shrubs. And they did decline, but it was not significant in, in one of the habitats. If we move to the right and look at what happened to the sandy plains, here um, the hemicryptophytes or perennial grasses is a more dominant feature of this, these habitats. And in the top graph, it's, it is indicated in green. And in the bottom graph, it's indicated in blue. And you can see in both instances, the decline was significant. Um, and also the, Karoo, uh, the mesome shrubs in habitat A, the black line, um, declined significantly in habitat A, and also uh, the, uh, the woody shrubs or the carubosis declined significantly in habitat B as well. What happened to annual life form cover? Now, the annual life form cover is very much dependent on the amount of rainfall that is received, especially winter rainfall, since this is a winter rainfall region. So you can see on the graphs, if you just look um, uh, superficially, you'll see that as rainfall increases, indicated by the blue lines, then the annual cover is generally higher, indicated by the black dots. Over time, though, it shows that, in, at least in the mountain valleys habitats, there was a significant increase in annual cover over time. But this may be an anomaly um, based on spatial and temporal variation in, in rainfall. Uh, because it can be different in closely situated areas. But also, as the perennial cover declined in time, um, there's more opportunity for the surveyor to strike annual cover plants or annual species that are in between the shrubs. So it may be actually a function of, of what we observe here. Uh, species richness. So total species richness did not change significantly over time. But if we look at perennial species richness in all four of the habitats, there was a significant decline over time. And then if we look at Shannon Wiener index of diversity for perennial species specifically, there was no significant observation of change over time. It was very flat except for one of the sandy plains habitats where there was a significant decline over in time. These tables show the relationship between rangeland condition and the different community variables that we sh that I just showed, just to show what are the important indicators that seem to correlate with a, a reduction or an condition. Um, and the common denominators here generally are perennial species richness, the total cover, perennial cover, annual rainfall, and then to a lesser degree, uh, the Shannon Wiener Index diversity. So in summary, this seven year drought period has caused a significant de de deterioration, de deterioration in the rangeland condition in both the plains and the hills habitats. Um, and the pressure on the rangeland from grazing initially at the onset of this survey period may have provided an additional um, impact on, on, the, on the change in the rangeland condition going further into the drought period. Um, perennial cover and species richness declined significantly, as indicated. Total cover declined significantly in the hills, but in the plains, the decline was not significant. And then species diversity was only correlated with decreasing rangeland condition in one of the habitats. And then, is, as I mentioned, they increased significantly with rangeland deterioration in one of these seals habitats, especially, but there may be other factors explaining that uh, observation. 
I would like to thank all my colleagues who assisted over the years with the surveys and still continue to do so, hopefully in the years to come. Um, our thanks to the WWF and the Les Hill Succulent Career Trust for funding for doing these surveys and also for co-researchers in assisting with reviewing this presentation. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry, Conrad, I was disconnected. I, I, I suppose you've completed your... <laughs> I was disconnected for a while. Uh, there, there are some questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting contribution. Uh, Peter Malan also agrees. It's a very interesting talk. He asked uh, if there are any signs yet of rangeland condition changes during COVID uh, and also pre-COVID times. Uh, have you... Have you witnessed any anything? Have you have you looked at that? <laughs> uh, COVID, I don't think it really. Yes. No, I can't imagine that. That it's. I don't think there's any relationship between what has happened in with COVID and our societies, as yes. you say, and at what has happened to the rangeland condition change. Uh, I don't think there's any connection there. <laughs> All right. So, um, in other words, there, yeah, there are no humans. Um, the, the uh, local people have been moved away, so they are not using yeah. that area. And, um, I just would like to ask, um, in terms of um, uh, livestock grazing, are there, is there any livestock grazing going on there? No, apart so the, on the specific, the game, nothing. Yeah. No. Um, so the area that I discussed also now, now that Rattlecross South property, it used to be a livestock farm up to about 2009 when it was incorporated into the reserve um, and prior to that the landowner had stopped farming for I think five or ten years so oh. effectively there was no grazing really mm. um, so I think and if you look at the historical rainfall records the property was at that stage in probably a fairly good condition prior to what this transpired now uh, with the drought okay okay Ladies and gentlemen, are there any more uh, questions to Conrad? You can post them or you can ask them yourselves. Thank you very much, Conrad, for a very interesting talk. Apologies that I was was not present during the no problem. part. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, um, I would like to uh, introduce the uh, Fourth presentation, the last one before our break, um, and um, it is uh, Nanamshla Gwedla that will tell us more about health clinic garden research in South Africa. Thank you, Nana. Over to you. Um, just to be sure, can everyone see my screen? It's fine, you can proceed. Okay. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Okay, got in full presentation. Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nanam Shagwenta, and today I'll be sharing with you results from one of the studies from the Border Health Clinic Gardens research that is entitled South African Health Clinic Gardens as Models for Social Ecological Systems, and we're looking at plant diversity and potential utilization. Gardens as essential types of green infrastructure are the most interconnected urban and rural areas and have a great influence on human health and well-being because of their close connection 
to humans. Items can be classified into different forms of ownership with the purpose of determining the variety of ecosystem services that they provide. Now, types of gardens can include those that are privately owned. And here we're talking about domestic gardens, home gardens, or even community gardens. Then we have those that are entity owned or government owned. Some are funded by the government and managed by the, um, by the government. And these include botanical gardens and school gardens. In South Africa, health clinic gardens are another type of garden that is developed by different stakeholders on government owned land. Now, in line with the provision of ecosystem services for improved quality of life, different types of gardens um, grow different plants that provide varying utility, that provide a variety of utilitarian properties. And these include types of food and medicines. But these should not um, just be focusing on food and medicine, but equally be considered for their provision of other ecosystem services as well. Um, plant selection decisions in gardens is determined or is driven by several factors, including socioeconomic factors, environmental priorities, and geographical regions, as well as owner preferences, because ultimately the aim is to enhance ecosystem services provision. Now, a few studies have explored plant distribution, plant diversity, and utilization in various types of urban, peri-urban, and rural gardens across South Africa. And most available studies focus on different gardens, uh, such as home gardens and community gardens, as spaces for food security and the culti cultivation of medicinal plants. Some of the detailed studies on the distribution and potential uses of plant species in gardens include that of Nemu Tsuzanai and colleagues in 2010 who found that rural home gardens around KZN have a higher percentage of naturally occurring indigenous useful plants compared to peri-urban areas. Lieb and others in 2011 later assessed the floristic composition of domestic gardens in Tlokwe and they outlined the, they outlined the contribution of domestic gardens to the plant diversity of urban ecosystems. A seminal contribution and, um, on distribution, diversity, and utilization is perhaps that of Malebatsi and others in 2010 who investigated the different use, use categories of garden plants in the Tswanachimo garden layout and found over 500 useful plant species from 105 different plant families. Now, bringing this back to bringing this back home and illuminating the social ecological nature of health clinic gardens. Celia et al. 2018 recently explored um, garden ecosystem services in sub-Saharan Africa and the role of health, clinic of health clinic gardens as social ecological systems and asserted that health clinics provide ideal green infrastructure because they are government funded, they are maintained by the government and they are linked to free healthcare and stand central within communities, making their gardens ideal social ecological systems for future studies um, into, or towards social ecological innovation. Now, the model of health clinic gardens is prevalent in South Africa, and their high visibility and accessibility positions them as sustainable gardens and strong cases for usefulness for other countries to follow. Against this background that I've just given you, this study sought to provide insight into, into the plant species composition of health clinic gardens to establish and ascertain their potential uses and position these gardens as alternative models to gardening in rural, peri-urban and urban areas. This study was conducted in the Northwest province of South Africa, which is, um, um, and the specific study area was the Bojanala district across five local municipalities. This district is in the Savannah biome, central bush bushveld, and is characterized mainly by thorny woodland vegetation. The province has just over 500,000 households and it is extremely high in poverty. Platinum mining, industrial development, as well as recreation are major economic drivers in the province. Now, how did we do this study? Very briefly, Across 103 health clinic gardens, we were looking at peri-urban and um, rural areas mostly, using the Twana Chimo garden layout, and we were identifying plant species. This happened in spring 2015, and we were classifying plants into different categories. 
And we were using um, different instruments such as the frequency of, of, of occurrence. We used literature sources to identify some of the plants as well as researcher observations to also look into how these uh, plant species may be used or, or or just to, to observe them and see what kind of species they are. And in terms of analysis, we were just, uh, for example, enumerating the number of gardens that have um, a specific species. And we were using basic statistics for correlations and differences in species composition. And the ANOVA tests were mainly used when we had to do stati statistical tests. Now, what did we find out? 116 plant families were found across all health clinic gardens. And these comprised of 404 genera and 645 species. And some of the most frequently encountered families included the Asterisae, Poesae, and Fabishae. And among the recorded genera, those species that uh, were previously included under Vichelia and Senegalia, as well as Erigratis and Euphorbia were the most uh, frequently occurring. Um, they consisted mostly of indigenous species also, and, and there were some that were native to the Northwest province, while those that were in the Euphorbia genus were mostly exotic. Uh, in terms of the most frequent species, um, we found grass species, which is um, the Cyodon dactolian as the most uh, frequently occurring, and these are both native to the Northwest province. And finally, herbaceous plants were the most dominant, followed by trees and shrubs. When we look at the life forms, uh, phenerophytes were the most abundant, and these were represented by 195 species. When we look at the origins of these species, 321 out of the 400, 645 species that were recorded, they were indigenous to South Africa, and of those, 210 were native to the Northwest province. When we look into the differences in species assemblages in health um, clinic gardens between the different local municipalities, these yielded no significant differences. Those, so there was no significant variation here. While there, was, there were significant differences in the number of species that were found between the various micro gardens within the health clinic gardens. And here we found that the Naha microgarden had more species than other microgardens, as we can see in figure three on the right. Um, taking a look at the classifications of plant species, we find that 14 of the exotic species that were encountered have been declared as invasive in various categories. As we can see in the table, we've got C3 invaders, um, category 1B invaders, and category three invaders, uh, for example. And these originate from various parts of the world, such as Mexico, Madagascar, South America, Central, Eastern, and Northern China, just to name a few. Now, despite their invasive potential, many of these have been found to be useful, as we can see in the last column, where some are used for food, such as fruit, medicinal, ornamental, etc. Um, looking at the second key finding, many of the encountered species across all the gardens have been identified as potentially useful. And here we're looking at about 426 species. And they have various purposes, including food and medicine. And some of these species overlap in terms of their uses, where one can be used both as a medicine or as a type of food or a fruit. An example of this could be the Zizifinus mucronata, which is used for both, which is used both uh, medicinally and as food. And the most dominant potential uses were the ornamental, medicinal, and food uses. And the ornamentally useful species were topping this list. We can see um, on figure four, this um, ornamental species were just close to 200 compared to species that were useful as a hedge, which was uh, pretty much less than 10, so to speak. Now, figure five illustrates the distribution of potential uses among those categories that I've just mentioned. And we, we, we deliberately picked out the medicinal as and, um, and the food ecosystem services here. And if we look at in the first part, which is the potential medicinal uses, 
we can see that plants that are used as a tonic were the most abundant, followed by those that are used to treat general ailments, and we also categorized those as general medicine. On the right, where we're looking at the foods that are species that are useful as food, uh, we can see that fruit was the most, fruit species were the most abundant, followed by leafy vegetables, as well as um, African leafy vegetables. In terms of um, the specific plants that are potentially useful, the Agapathus species, for example, was one, was one that was uh, encountered the most. It was found in 40 gardens in the category of medicinally useful plants. And it's an indigenous plant, which is a good thing. And unfortunately, it is poisonous, just as an example. And when we look at the edible plants, we're looking at the grass species, which is the Eurocloa mosambicensis, and this can be used as a grain. Fortunately, again, this one is native and it was found in 83 health clinic gardens. Now, looking, drawing this back and making conclusions, we can see that much like home and domestic gardens and other type of gardens that have been investigated in the past, Health clinic gardens have a variety of plant species that represent an enormous number of genera, as, as well as coming from various um, families. We also see that plant resources support humans and provide goods like, like food. And here we're talking about fruit, we're talking about grain, grains, and we're talking about vegetables. And there are also medicinal plants. In other instances, we see fodder as well. We need to admit that plants also provide cultural services such as spiritual, aesthetic, and inspirational values. And a very clear example of this was the presence of hedges in some of these health clinic gardens, which um, for some people may serve as an aesthetic value. As a result, um, given all these um, supporting services to humans or provisioning, we can conclude that gathering activity for what many may term as wild plants is rapidly increasing. That is understandable because people seem to be using these plants or to put it um, in another way, most of these plants seem to be useful to people. Now health clinic gardens in the Northwest are very much uh, reminiscent of other garden types and they reflect most of the basic structure of other garden types with very minor differences here and there. Therefore, I think it's, it's safe to say that health clinic, uh, uh, gardens around clinics or hospitals can be used as an alternative to other types of privately owned or entity or even government owned established gardens where challenges such as lack of land, for example, lack of security, shortage of water, they continue to persist. Now, given the envisaged purpose of, um, of health clinics, future research, health clinics and health clinic gardens, future research could investigate how traditional knowledge on useful indigenous and um, naturalized species can be illuminated and restored to position these gardens or health clinic as spaces that will encourage their use as well as champion their supply among communities, especially for poor households. Uh, and you've these got are the one, one minute left. These are the references that we, um, we used in the study. And I'd like to acknowledge facilities managers as well as groundsmen, the NRF for funding the study, as well as the NWU for funding the study, and the cooperation from the health department, the provincial health uh, department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nana. There you are. Thank you, Nana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions? Maybe just a question from my side, uh, Nana. In terms of uh, further further use of the uh, 
of, of the data that you've um, that you've presented here um, how would you go about to to use that specific information in, in future studies um, in terms also of the, the social social aspects that as you mentioned in the beginning okay the the, the, the immediate thing that jumps up to me was that for example this data that we that was collected for this particular presentation that I've given today, it wasn't, for example, verified with the communities or the people who are supposedly using these plants. So one way that could um, that this kind of data could be used socially would be to, for example, compile a list of of these species which we've identified as potentially useful, and actually go into the communities, the people who are supposedly using these species and actually find out from them how they use them and how maybe they can, um, I don't know, give pointers on how such species can be conserved or preserved. And I think um, the, the, the keynote address in the morning did speak a little bit to something like that. I hope I'm, yes. I'm answering your question. Thank, thank you very much. Are there any questions? All right, thank you, Nana. That wraps this first part of our uh, session one up. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the uh, presenters and, and all um, the people who also pose questions uh, in the audience. Um, we will have uh, a 10 minute uh, comfort break now. And then after that, we will uh, complete with four more presentations. Thank you very much.